and uh, because it's the same thing. The foundations of church doesn't change over years. So that was something that we preached when we started Messiah Church. That was how many years ago now? 15 years ago. Okay, I put Dwar logo because it's exactly the same slides and the same message preached in Dwar when we started eight and a half years ago. It's the same foundation and the same thing that I will be sh I share in the different commission churches that we go to or, or, or share and build with. And so I want to share is what I'm sharing with you today is something that we in commission, we in New Frontiers, we in building church, we believe that these foundations are important and essential. And I'm not in any way saying that you haven't been building. Uh, I'm saying that, in fact, some of the core values that you shared have got a, a lot of overlap or similarities on some of the things that we're sharing. But I, we've looked at it, and I know there are um, apostolic guys around the globe of New Frontiers and all who would be sharing similar things. I've been greatly helped by Dave Devnish years ago, like 15 years ago when I was talking, greatly helped by my interactions with him to say, hey, what are the foundations of uh, the church? And, uh, um, and that's what we want to look at. Oh, we've already gone to the first one. Okay, how did that happen? Anyway, that's the first one. Then I'm going to be sharing on eight apostolic foundations. Okay, over these days, uh, maybe just the next two um, sessions, uh, and let's uh, look at that. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. This is what it says, verse 19. So then you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So you see here three very key things that um, uh, Paul is talking about here. Uh, he, he's talking about, earlier he talked about how you're saved, then he's talking about how you're one in mind in Christ, and then he says, okay, now he comes down and says, okay, you are now one family, and you are one people. And uh, so he says, when you're building this, he says, the first thing he's saying, you're built on the foundations of apostles and prophets. We're talking about foundations of a church, and that's a very key verse here. He's saying the churches should be built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. What did they bring that we need to get hold of so that the church is built on the right foundations? And um, apostles brought revelation, which was hugely in contrast to what the Jews believed. You know, you and I may not get hold of it, but you can imagine that when these apostles were actually preaching, and when the first church is starting, he's talking to the Jews, huge contrast to what they had already believed, or what they were actually committed to. And they were, they were going to be saying something completely different. And so, you know something? Significance is seen when there is contrast. Some statements in themselves are not significant. But when you see it in, in contrast, it becomes hugely significant. And so for these people there, whatever the apostles are now laying the foundations, they're actually uprooting much of what they believed. And they're putting something absolutely new in the foundations of these people who believed in Christ. And so that's why this laying of foundations or the, the apostolic foundation is so crucial then and even now. They're talking about something completely new, the new way of the spirit, the new revelation of the people of God, the new understanding of the world. I mean, it was just everything that they were going to be teaching now was going to be absolutely new. It wasn't about changing practice. What the, the apostles were talking to these new converts, the new people who were believing in Christ, was not about changing practice. Practice. Oh, okay, so now you know what, okay, can I eat something? Can I not eat something? Can I do this thing or can I not do that? And the temptation was for everyone to go to practice. And the temptation for all of us, even when we are building church, we can immediately focus first of all, okay, what should we do? And there was a joke in the early days, you know, a new church is when you have an OHP and you sit in a circle. And you've got to, oh, you have started a new church. And, and it was just thinking of the practice. What was the new kind of song you sing? Oh, we are no longer doing the traditional things, we are doing things differently. No, that's nothing, you know, tomorrow you will do something differently. It's not about practice and they were not focusing on practice. They were, building, they were bringing something fundamentally different to what they had thought so far. 
And that's why it's, it's foundational change. It wasn't about religious activities. Or well, let's do this a little differently. It was something changing completely. So that's the first thing we got to of course, that the church needs to be built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And we look at what those foundations are uh, in, in a while. The second thing in this scripture we look, like, look at, he says is, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. That's again a very fascinating phrase. So what he's saying is, okay, we, the apostles are going to be laying this, the apostles are going to be talking about this, something completely new and different, but it's not their clever idea. Jesus is still the cornerstone. And how the buildings would be built then was in the architect, they would first put a cornerstone. And then everything of that building was measured from the cornerstone. So where will the door be? Measure from cornerstone. This is where the door is done. Where will the next wall be? You and I will think the clever thing to do is measure from here to here where the next wall is. That's what he's saying. Where the next wall is, you measure again from the cornerstone and say, okay, where will the next wall be? That's how they would construct. So the cornerstone became the most fundamental place from which everything was then constructed. All measurements were from the cornerstone. And what he's saying in this building of God's church that he's building, Jesus Christ is cornerstone. Anything and everything you do in church life should be based on Jesus Christ. Amen? On what he says, not just, oh, this apostolic guy is great, or this apostle. No, no, no. The cornerstone is still Jesus. And so for all these guys, so you know what you'll see in, in scripture, there were apostles who actually disagreed with each other. Say, hey, so who is the greater apostle? Who's the lesser apostle? No, no, no. Let's just see who is saying what based on the cost. Amen? Men can go wrong. We all can go wrong. You know, the one who will never go wrong is Jesus Christ. And so in everything that we build, he's saying, oh, Jesus Christ is going to be the chief constant. Build on the apostolic foundations, but keep Jesus as the chief cornerstone. That's the second thing you see in the scripture. And then obviously he keeps talking about you are being built together. God is building his church and there's a call of God upon all of us to be with him in this amazing building that he is building. Um, so the church should be built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And it's, I found it interesting that we... From yesterday, we've been talking a lot about breaking down. That's a dangerous thing to say, is it? You know, what do you mean by breaking down? You know, and especially if you've been involved in this church for quite some time, it's a bit scary to have that thought as well. You know, what do you mean? We didn't do everything properly about so far. Why should we break anything down? Or whatever. But it's a nice point to make. The point I'm going to say is, when we're starting a new church, you make sure that you're building on the right foundations. And as you're going on in church life, it's good to sit back and review again and say, hey, are we on right foundation? Because it's happened in the past, it's happened even in churches in the Bible that people drifted away from the foundations. And so there would be times that you have to go back and say, hey, uproot, put this again. Something went wrong in that one and, and, and we drifted away. So it's a good thing that there will be things that might actually, while we're going through this, saying, you know what, actually we probably not paid attention to this. And say, let's just make sure that our foundation is, is, is strengthened again. Kakana, in some ways, okay, it's one church, but a new congregation is make sure that you have putting in the right foundations of it. You know, churches will have differences of expressions. Churches will have differences of style, language, expression, music. I mean, there are multiple different ways of, those are the externals. And sometimes people get very affected by the externals. And you see how he's doing churches so different. Ah, this one better. You see how he's doing external. What obviously comes out in the external uh, demonstration is what is based on what is rooted in things. So the things to look at in church life is this the foundation right? Expressions can be different. And I know of people who actually get very affected if the expression is something else and they say, oh no, that doesn't seem right. No, look at the root. If the foundation is fine, the expression can be anything. Amen. In terms of culture, you know, um, one of the greatest things about the Christian faith is across the globe, which I'm so delighted about, is that you can, you can be of any culture 
and you can still build on the right foundation and Jesus Christ can still be the same cornerstone and you can glorify God in any language, any culture, any dress, any anything because the foundation is right. Amen? Did you agree with that one? <laughs> Malayalam, I know people say it's God's own country and all that but you know, there are multiple expressions everywhere. Okay? And, and, and everything is beautiful. It really is a huge contrast from every other religion you can think of. In terms of this expression. So if you are, you think of Islam, everything has to come back to Mecca in Arabic. Then that's true form. That's a true form. But it's a form, it's an external. It's the language and, and, and a location. Praise God, there is no Mecca for Christianity. Amen? Amen? There is no. Even though you make your holy land trips and all that. There is no, there is no holy land. The only thing holy water is Jesus actually walked. Okay, fine. You go and see where he walked. But that's not our foundation. And the beauty of the church is you can actually be in any culture, any language. If the foundation is right and Jesus is the cornerstone, it's a great church. Hallelujah. In whichever language and whichever culture. That's the beauty of this amazing thing that Jesus has brought us into. And you notice that every religion has got something in the external that will bind you. There's only Christ and this amazing faith that actually releases you in the externals. That's because, and it releases you in the externals only if your foundation is correct. If your foundation is wrong, it will reflect wrongly in your external. Then you'll get really affected about some of the things. The reason is not the reason is because something went wrong in the foundation. You get what I'm saying? You know, and so I want you to really see the importance of asking those questions of how your foundation of your faith is. Okay, let's go to the first one. The first apostolic foundation, which I think is absolutely crucial, is the understanding of the gospel, the understanding of the grace of God, the understanding of who we are in Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the true gospel. Sin, salvation, work of the cross is fundamental to what we believe. You can have churches and there are churches that can talk very good things on human behavior, can talk about prosperity, can talk about everything. The question I look at is are they preaching the cross? Are they saying that this man is sinful, needs Jesus? And, and the complete gospel. If that's not being preached, something fundamentally is wrong. And even if you have thousands of people coming, so nice, I felt so nice, it's not about feeling, it's about the foundation. The gospel is absolutely crucial to our understanding. The cross is absolutely fundamental. Paul said, I preach Christ crucified. Amen? That's what it is. It could be, he says, oh, foolishness to the wise. Yeah, it may be. But we are willing to be fools, but we will not drift away from the foundation of what we believe in the gospel. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's fundamental. Do you share Christ crucified? You know, many a times I've heard people say this, come to Jesus, all your problems will be solved. Not the gospel. Amen? That's not the gospel. In fact, Jesus prophesied, in this world you will have many troubles. Exactly opposite of what you just preached to your neighbor. But we are using our amazing and you know what, will it be easy for people to just start coming there little little? He'll feel so nice, he'll feel I love him. Yeah, fine, do all that. But that's not the foundation of In fact, even in terms of our journey into Christ, God uses amazingly different ways to bring us to faith. Okay? Healing is one big one. The number, you go to rural parts of India, the number of people who believe only because they were healed is huge, miraculous. We don't see those kind of miracles that some of those people see in the rural areas. Crazy stuff happens there. Demons being cast out left, right and center and then you say, yeah, what is happening here? It's an amazing sense of the spiritual. And then someone's healed of cancer and they say, oh, this Jesus has healed me and put your faith in Jesus. And we all rejoice, praise God, wonderful. But that's not the foundation of our faith. Because tomorrow if his family member gets TB and he says, oh, this Jesus is a healer and prays and he doesn't get healed, his faith is going to be completely shattered. Amen? Why? Because the foundation of his faith was Jesus healed. Jesus does heal, but that is not the foundation of our faith. Amen? Gospel is the foundation of our faith. 
What Jesus did on the cross is the foundation of our faith. Similarly, in terms of when you are very depressed, and you say, well, I was committing, wanting to commit suicide, and I don't know, nobody loves me, and then I met someone from the community of grace, and they love me, and they love me, and this is amazing, I love Jesus. And you, you put your faith in Jesus. Why? Because I was going to commit suicide. I was so depressed. The church loved me and hugged me and embraced me. And they love Jesus. I love Jesus. Brilliant. That happens. But that cannot be the foundation of your faith. Tomorrow that guy doesn't say hi to you. You're finished. Do you understand what I mean? It is why? Because your faith was big. All these are entry points. Not the foundation. The foundation still remains the same. Jesus Christ died on the cross. And you put your faith in him. Your sin is forgiven. Your relationship with God is restored. You become a citizen of heaven. And nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Amen. So whether TB gets healed or doesn't get healed, I'm still a child of God and I'm still a citizen of heaven. If I get some provision from God or I don't get a provision from God, I'm still a child of God and I can glorify Him forever. Those things don't change. You know something Paul had understood someday. Paul was a crazy guy. Sometimes I read what I say, my goodness, this guy was amazing. He gets 30, uh, 40 lashes minus one four times or five times. He's shipwrecked. He's this. He's gone through such crazy things. And then this is the same Paul who says, Rejoice in the Lord. Now, how can you say that? How can you say rejoice the Lord, uh, rejoice in the Lord when you're going through so much? And then the same Paul says, You know what? I've learned the secret to be content. When I have plenty, I'm content. When I have nothing, I'm content. Hey, what is this? How can you be like that? Do you know why? Because his life was built on the foundation. On the right foundation. Whether I have, I'm still a child of God forgiven. Whether I don't have, I'm still a child of God I'm forgiven. Whether I'm lashed or I'm not lashed, I'm still a child of God. I've understood the gospel. The foundation of his faith is solid. Amen. And that's how it should be for all of us in this church. And saying, this is what I believe. The gospel. That's the foundation was so radically different from the Jews they were preaching. Do you know what I mean? Their faith was based on something completely different. And now they're saying, I'm laying a new foundation. Their faith is based on the Can you imagine Nicodemus coming to Jesus? Now, Nicodemus is this solid guru, this high Jewish ruling council, white beard, and very learned fellow. And he comes and meets Jesus. And Jesus says, You must be born again. He could even completely false. And then there's this powerful statement that he makes. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You must not be surprised. You must be born again. And you know how radical that would be for Nicodemus or any of the Jews for that matter? Because for them, they are part of this faith. They are the people of God. They say, no, 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 listen. That was flesh wala birth. You need a spiritual birth. You need to be born again. That's the gospel. And I find, similar to Nicodemus, we can face the same problem in our city. Families come to the Lord. Why did he come? My, my father believed that what changed in his life, now I also believe. Or someone else, whole family is coming to church, I also come up about it. And they will throw your heart of the church. Every person needs to be born again and becomes the the foundation of their life. Amen? Not based, not based on your birth. You're born in a Christian family, that doesn't make you a Christian. You need to be born again. And then you become part of the Christian. I come from a Hindu family. I tell you, when I came, I came to Christ and I used to meet so many Christians who didn't believe in Jesus, but they were Christians. And I said, how are you Christian, Baba? You don't even believe in Jesus. I don't know what John Fernandez That's all that. It doesn't make it your Christian. That doesn't make it. That doesn't happen. You know, the foundation of our faith of understanding the gospel is so Crucial. Understanding of grace is so crucial. You know, some of us give us uh, some of the students who are not too good in their exams. Uh, for them, passing mark is how? What is the passing mark in the schools in Kerala? I like my wife answering that as she's from Kerala. I was the first person to answer. <laughs> Thirty-five. Okay. So if a person gets thirty, he's failed. But if the teacher gives him five marks more, that's what's called grace marks. Everyone knows grace marks. Very few people know grace. Grace marks, everyone knows. That's, that's the order of the day sometimes, you know? you know. And so, what is the meaning of giving him five marks? 
is you don't deserve these five marks and have grace on you, you are receiving what you don't deserve. That's what grace is. So he gets this grace marks. That's what Jesus done. Now let me ask you a question. If Jesus is 100% holy, where are you? 10%, 20%, 50%, 70%? How many of you think you are, if Jesus is 100%, how many of you think you are on 50% holy? One, two. How many of you think you are 70% holy? How many of you think you are 10%? Yeah. <coughs> two, three hands. How many 20? I'm a little better. How many don't feel there's any percentage only in your life? <laughs> We live our lives in the way of relative thinking. Very often, even if you've not put your hand up or put your hand on, that's how we think. You know, I'm actually not that bad after all. If you ask yourself inside, that drunkard is conscious, I'm not like that. And then you actually feel a little better than you're not like that. You know, are you most terrible? And then we are like the Pharisee. He says, thank God I'm not like that with right? I'm not like that tax collector. I do my religious things nicely. You know what? We can think of the Pharisees like that, but many of us actually go through those thoughts at times. And actually feel like we are a little bit. But you know what the grace of God says? That we all were actually zero. Not 10%, 20%, 50%. Some were slightly self-righteous. Actually, I feel like Jesus. I'm quite like Jesus now. Just a little bit more I need to change, but otherwise I'm alright. He says zero. It's zero. That's what it says in Ephesians 2. He says you were dead in your sin. Absolutely zero. So in God's eyes, Dawood Ibrahim is zero and you're also zero. Yeah, what is this God? How can it be like that? But it is. In, in, in front of the holiness of God, you are as zero. And then when you believe in Jesus and his grace comes upon you, you don't become 20% or 50%. You actually become 100%. That's the grace of God. For marks, 30 to 35 is grace. For our lives in God, 0 to 100 is the grace of God. Hallelujah. You are actually as holy as Jesus. That time you find that very hard to believe, don't you? Not because you're great, but because it says in the Bible, you've received the imputed righteousness of Jesus. When God looks at you, you say you're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. That is the foundation of what we believe. And you know, many churches you will find, and many people is within churches who actually don't believe that, even though they think it is true, they don't actually believe it. And you say, Are you a saint? Mother Teresa is a saint, how can I be a saint? How many of you believe you are a saint? Akka, tell your neighbor you are a saint. That you are a saint. If you know the name, tell the name also. Saint so and so. Saint so and so. You are a saint so and so. You are a saint, you are a saint. Yeah, absolutely. It just saints because, and that's the right foundation. The church is a community of saints, saved by the grace of God. That's a foundation. Who we are in Christ is so important. Whether your circumstance goes right or wrong or whatever, you are still a child of God. You're still forgiven. You're still restored. You're completely a citizen of heaven. The amazing truths of who we are in Christ is fundamental as a foundation of uh, our faith and the church will be built on that foundation and you know what very easily people will come in and without you realizing it you'll try to penetrate saying no no little this and little that and that's what happened in church in the bible in the galatian book of galatians people came in there and they were called the circumcision group okay ours out here we might be i don't know we can call the good works group or the charity group, or the this group, or the that group. And they come in and then they put the overemphasis on certain work. Overemphasis on something. Like the circumcision group came in and said, oh, no, no, fine, fine, faith in Jesus and all that, but circumcision also must be there. That's what they were basically saying. And you look at Galatians chapter 1, let's just, let's just read it, if anyone can read that, from verse 6 onwards. Someone read that from verse 6 onwards. And astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and 
garment according to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven to preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let it be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let it be accursed. For I am now seeking the rule of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay. Look at the seriousness of these words again. Okay? The seriousness of these words. He's saying if anyone is bringing anything other than the gospel and the grace of God, he says, let it be cursed. That's pretty strong words. Okay? It's not like, hey, it's a thing. You know, just reduce it a little bit. You know, it's not, it's not the thumb. He says, it's fundamentally wrong. If you're adding anything, if the church is adding any practice as fundamental, that's fundamentally wrong. And in verse 8, he's saying, if anyone adds this, let it be eternally condemned, etc., etc., and then again in verse 9 he repeats it. It's not like after 10 chapters he reminds us. Verse 8 says that and again on verse 9 he says, And I say this again to you. Remember this. You shift away from the gospel which is there's no other gospel. There is only one gospel. You move away from this he says, you be eternally condemned. So I want us as a church to see the significance of this. Don't ever get carried away about anything else in the externals. Let's make sure we're building a church absolutely on the gospel, absolutely on the grace of God. Amen? That's why I'm absolutely telling our people, come what may, you are children of God. The book of Corinthians is absolutely fantastic. You see that book. It starts chapter 1. Paul is raving about all these guys. Raving, literally saying, oh, how great you guys are. I thank God for you. I'm just always delighting in you and, and amazing, amazing, amazing. And then you go to chapter 4 and say, what a messed up people. <coughs> What a mess of people! There's division, sexual immorality, struggling with meetings, 20 people prophesying over one another, and it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, food sacrifice to idols, they're all confused, everything they seem to be confused, their lives are pretty messed up. But if the foundation of the church is not in the foundation of the gospel and the grace, Paul would not be able to write chapter 1. And you think of it, he actually starts and he says, listen, I know all this. It's not like after child writing chapter 1, he got to know what happened in chapter 8. He knew what was happening and still was able to write chapter 1. I rejoice in God for who you are. Because he's understood, not only for himself, he's understood the foundation of his faith. He's understood the foundation of this faith for everybody who believes in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And if you understand this, we will not be judgmental. You know, our lives reflect what we believe. We can state, you know what, I believe in the grace of God. But watch the life that will reflect if he's understood the grace of God. Amen? Amen? If you are a person who grumbles all the time, you haven't understood grace. You know what? Because the only thing you deserve is hell. Just be grateful for anything and everything that you have. All that you have is the grace of God. Amen? You'll be a thankful person. If you understand the grace of God, you will be a thankful person. Lord, I deserve nothing, but I've received everything from you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Don't be so foolish to actually grumble about and actually you know what we grumble about small things. Small, small things we grumble about. This is not happening, that is not happening. You know, today the sun is hotter than yesterday. Damn, what is this like? Hey, Baba, you'll be in fire or hell. Just give thanks. That you're saved. Amen. Do you know what I mean? And, and it reflects the way you live your life. It reflects what you have actually believed. Let's be a people. That's not judgment. We judge one another. You know, this one. No, we judge. In fact, you want to be hard, be hard on yourself and soft on the other. If you really like being hard. Amen. <laughs> you know, that's my personality. Do it on yourself. That's what Jesus actually said. He said, you know, take off the log from your eye. Then you will be able to see clearly and take out the speck of your Sorry. Okay. I'll say love, love me. Take out the big, big, big fellows in you. The big blunder is in you. Take out that big blunder, then you might be able to see clearly. It's just people on the heart. Don't be judgmental. 
You know, people who give, those who understand grace, give grace to others. Because they know what grace they receive. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay, I've taken quite a bit of time on the first foundation. But I think it's really fundamental. Many, many churches go the wrong route. And you know what happens after some time? And the, uh, the other thing that happens is, because we want to grow the church, sometimes we dilute some of the things. He hits it badly. It's okay. Or he's, he's bringing some people to come in and bring some teaching. So you have to do this. And then he feels super content that you haven't done it the way. You know? We all tend to take shortcuts because we think law works. Grace works, even if it takes longer. Grace works. Amen. Can I give you an example? Yeah, that I'm talking this way. Even if it's taking a little longer. Okay. I, remember, I may have shared this story with you, but it had a real impact on my life. Okay. There was a friend of ours who lived in Dubai, and he was telling this story. He was a pastor. Okay. And so he's he's a pastor, and then someone came to meet him. Someone who doesn't believe, walking his own way, and he comes to his home, and then says. Uh, do uh, you have an ashtray? Can I smoke? And this pastor had never thought of keeping an ashtray in his house. Like for him, it was like super sinful to have an ashtray in his house. And so he said, no, uh, not, only, not only did he say, I don't have an ashtray. He said, no, I don't have an But I would really appreciate it if you, you, know, you don't smoke. I, I, I don't like anyone smoke. That's fine. What's it back? He never met him again. He just never met him again. Never came to visit him. Now it's foolish. I mean, it's really cannot be that important, but it was for him. He began to feel convicted this pastor saying, yeah, did I do something wrong? You're not even coming over this business. Then he, he felt the Lord speak to him. You judged him. You weren't gracious to him. I'll be gracious to you, but you weren't gracious to him. So this pastor then goes out and buys an ashtray. Now for him, it's radically different to think of that. You know? And he goes and buys an ashtray and brings his ashtray home. And then someone else comes in his home, after a few months or something, and says, hey, is it okay if I smoke? He says, sure, one sec. And he goes and brings the ashtray. And he keeps the ashtray and they keep talking. That guy kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. He was accepted for who he is. Months down the line, he believed in Christ. And a few weeks after that, he stopped smoking. This pastor is telling the story, saying, I learned something, grace works. Lord it. If you and I have understood grace, we'll be able to accept people because we've understood how God has accepted us. And a church that accept, accepts like that, a church that has understood the foundation of grace will be gracious. We'll know what it means to build a church on the foundation of grace. Amen? It's a fundamental one, guys. It comes in so... You know, because we are wired religiously. Whichever religion you come from, our natural upbringing has been religious in some way or the other. And so he's saying, you've got to uproot that, knock that off, and you're building a new foundation. Foundation of the gospel, the grace of God, and who we are in Christ. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. As I said earlier, there will be things that I'll be sharing today, with, uh, which, you know, some stuff uh, which has already mentioned and has, has, has core values, etc. But the church, the foundation of that you are actually a new people of God. And that would have been so radical for the Jews of that day. In fact, the way they say, the birthing of the church, church on the day of Pentecost, and the people came to Christ. And this is what it says in the book of Acts. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was an adding of people into the apostles, into these leaders, and they were becoming a new community. They were just becoming a new people of God. And it was distinctly different. Can you imagine apostles were telling the people who thought that they are the people of God, and he was telling those people, na na na, this is now the people of God. That's radically different. It's something to say to someone who is a complete gone case and is living a sinful life and say, you know what, you believe you can become part of the people of God. It's like, wow, 
You are telling to someone like Nicodemus. You are telling to someone he's Pharisee. You are telling to this to religious fellows who think that they are the people of God. And now you are telling, listen, you need to now join this. This is the people of God. That's completely new. That's totally new. It's building on a completely different foundation. It's not like, you know what, you became a little different from before. It's new. This community is a brand new community <coughs> in God's eyes. It's a brand new people of God. The people of the New Testament. And that revelation, I tell you, we need to get. Jesus began to start that a little bit in terms of, well, actually, the new people of God. Um, as I said, how radical it would have been for those Jews. This was the start of a totally new community. You must understand the significance of this. And as I said in the Galatians or the others, there was this, and at that time they were not even called Christians, they didn't know, there was no structure, there was nothing. This was like all these kind of <laughs> rambling around, you know, you know are, are we still that, not that, are we new, what? And you know, that, I can, I can imagine being a Jew at that time. Also, it's so confusing. You know, Moses, 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 Jesus is greater than Moses. So what is happening now? Can I not be this and this? And they say, no. This is something completely new. And that actually happens also in some of the set, uh, settings where I, as I told you, I come from a Hindu family and then in my journey, I, I didn't even, before I became a Christian, I didn't know anything about Christianity. All I knew was there's some Jesus who, you know, I've seen some paintings of someone dying on the cross. And I would say, that's the God of the Christians. All I, mean. I wasn't. I did my education in engineering and nothing, no knowledge of God and religion. In fact, I used to go and wish people on Good Friday. Happy Good Friday. Yeah? I had no idea it was not so happy. Happy Good Friday. And this Christian would be totally wondering what this guy is. This Hindu knows nothing or nothing. But that's how I was. I didn't know what denomination is. I didn't know what is different than Catholic and Protestant and Baptist and this and that. I have no idea. All I knew was. Jesus, the grace of God, I'm a child of God. Amazing. That's all I knew. And then I would meet Christians. And they would then ask myself, which, which denomination? I said, what are you talking about? Achha, you're that. No, no, ours is a little different. We are this. Anyway, you'll get to know when you go. Are they, are? They were folk. I mean, they were not rejoicing in my genuine conversion of being part of this new community they were more concerned about how which community how community this community this one is like that that one is like this this one is like that oh, yeah. and that happens today i can imagine how the jews would be confused christians are confused today they are more bothered about which denomination you are in rather than rejoicing in the community god has placed you and building on the right foundation amen and i tell you that's what we want new that's an identity. One family. That's again a revelation. God loves families. God loves families. There's a lot of teaching in terms of honor your father and mother. There's a lot of teaching in terms of husband and wife. There's a lot of teaching in terms of bringing up our children. God loves families. You know? And yet, Jesus brings in an aspect of us understanding God's family quite different sometimes from natural family. He will sometimes bring things into perspective. And I'm telling, you, telling this to a church that is a very good family church. You know, all our churches are, you know, we just love nice family. You know, most, most, the best small groups are where the best food is. We just look forward to hey, let's just chill together and you know, let's have family together. I mean, we pray also, but let's just have fun. <laughs> you know, we message, you know, that's, that's what we are. Kind of, you know. But Jesus was so radical, you know. There was a time when Jesus was teaching and people came uh, and said, you know, mother is waiting for you at the door. Mother was pretty upset. Huh? Mary was really upset. Why? This father's teaching from morning to night, hasn't eat, eaten food. Has he eaten food or not? I mean, and the mothers are the same today also. You notice that? I've heard so many kind of, you know, even my mother, you know, the, Aloha, the first question is, had food? 
and I've heard that n number of people, you know, even Mukul, because the mother knows, even though he talks in Malayalam, I don't understand much, but I said, what happened? She just asked whether I ate food. He's like, you know, and, and Mary was like that. And, and, and so Mary is saying, you know, what's wrong with him? In fact, this is what it says. Mary says, he has gone out of his mind. Wow, can you imagine saying that to Jesus? He's gone mad. That's what Mary thought of Jesus. He's gone mad. Why? He's not eating food. He's only teaching from morning to evening. And so he sends word. Mama's coming. I mean, in India, no, Mama's word is solid. Especially for the boys. You know? Kyo, Mami And so, come and mix this dialogue out there. And Jesus' answer is absolutely amazing. Jesus says, Who are my father and mother and brother and brothers? All these. Who is the will of God? What an answer. Jesus, what, Jesus, didn't you say honor father and mother? Yeah. But he brings perspective to our understanding of the family of God. He says, don't, don't see the family of God as something secondary. In fact, he puts it as something primary. And says, this is the new family of God. Value this. This is a spiritual family. Have that foundation. Even though you are honoring your father and mother and this, this, this. This is fundamental. Amen? Amen. Now you and I will go through challenges in our families. And sometimes you will be at crossroads of your families. But you got to figure out. I went through that when I put my faith in Jesus. So I remember my dad coming to me. And this is not like I'm a kid. You know, I've, I've finished my engineering. I'm in my final year. And you know, I'm just looking out there. Okay, take my job and settle down, etc. etc. And he sits me down and he says, You've got to make a choice. This family or Jesus and that family? There's a choice. He says, If you follow Jesus and go that route, you have to leave the house. Get out. But if you leave that, then you can be part of this family, our family. Now that is the rubber hits the road at that time, isn't it? My dad is pretty well off and he's got this massive bungalow in Mumbai and all this. The comfort of that house would be so nice. Get out and get out. Where? What a choice that you and I have to make. But if you haven't put your, your foundation of what you believe, it's a very tough decision to make. And so me, I was going to say, Daddy, I love you, but I, I cannot leave Jesus. I will follow the Spirit. That's my family. My dad was radical. He is willing to leave me and this for that. It was only possible because of the foundation of our understanding of what the gospel is and what the new family is. Amen? Yeah. When you come to those crossroads in life, it will depend on what you actually believe. If your sight is on the benefits of the natural, you will not be able to do something of value of the gospel. And Jesus made some, some deadly statements which very family loving church doesn't like to make. He says, unless you leave your father and mother and this and fields and everything for me and the gospel, you're not fit for me. What are you saying? Lord? That's too tough. Why is he able to say that? He's not saying don't. In fact, Jesus is not saying, unless you hate, my, hate your father. What do you mean by that? Yeah? Have you ever read that verse and wondered what is wrong with Jesus? He's not saying hate your father. He's bringing perspective. He's bringing perspective of the spiritual angle, saying, no, this is what you need to value greater. Jackie found it very hard when we got married and my parents. Jackie, you know, just share something about your journey with the. So when uh, we got married, uh, his, his parents did not accept us at all. Some of you know the story. And uh, we had to make that choice of following Jesus and doing what Jesus wanted. But at the same time, the scripture verse that says, Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may have long life. And so we decided to follow Jesus, but at the same time, honor our father and mother. So I in-laws had made a decision that they will never come to our home 
and uh, they didn't come to our home for 15 years of our marriage, the first 15 years, they didn't come at all. But we decided that, you know, they are, this is our family of God and we love Jesus and we want to follow Jesus. But at the same time, these are our family as well. And the Bible says on them. And so we kept going, we kept going. We took both our children every week to visit them. And um, so we, we did both. So that's the perspective Samir is talking about. Because we can go the other other way around and say that, okay, this is what Jesus is saying. And then, you know, we don't honor them at all. And we did both of these over the years. And now, 28 years later, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, this last month, came to our home. They lived in our home for 11 days. And they actually stayed with them. You know, they are happy and they were happy with me and they actually said that. So it is, it is a test, it is a challenge, but we need to do both. But whatever Jesus says, we need to follow that. You know, for Jackie to say that now is easy. I know how hard it is when you are rejected from your natural family. But then in the midst of that, for you to know the security you have in Christ and you have a spiritual family. And, and that's Jesus said, hey, listen. And many of us can take decisions based on natural family. God wants you and I to take decisions knowing that there is a spiritual family that God wants to know. And that's the foundation. Radical churches are those churches that value the family of God, irrespective of the challenge of the natural. Amen. That's what these all these disciples in the Bible, they were radical. There's something, that was not right. hey, a good idea, let's go and get beaten up. No, no, There was something fundamental that was sorted. And when that's sorted, the externals can be handled irrespective. If you know you are part of the church, if you know your buildings together, come what may, you will be connected to see this is the new family of God. This world. The one new man in Christ thing is amazing. I told you earlier in terms of how... Um, the Christian faith you can have and you can be any people, any culture across the globe and we're still there. But you know what, I look back and I think that actually happened because of one amazing thing that happened between Peter and Paul. What we are experiencing, and I, sometimes I wonder if that had gone wrong, I wonder what the Christian scene would have been across the globe. What was it? Now Peter, okay, Peter, Apostle Peter. He's in the church, which has got Jews and Gentiles. And then it says some section of Jews come into the church. What does Peter do? Peter slips away from the Gentiles and goes and has food with the Jews. He was scared. You see, looking at the natural, hey, these are from the Jewish, this is the Gentiles. Oh, he actually did that. And then Paul comes in, another apostle. And what does the Bible say? Paul rebuked Peter in front of everyone. That again goes against most of the things we do. To rebuke someone, go behind him, run the room, console him, talk nicely, keep the food and all that. This guy was bold. Why? Because he knew this was totally against the very foundation of the church. And everyone needs to know that we want to build strong and right. And he rebukes Peter and said, how can you do this? Why? Because we are all one new family where there is no Jew, no Gentile, no rich, no poor, no male, no female. We are one in Christ Jesus. You understood something? That's the foundation of our faith. But you know what? Peter got it wrong. Chances are you and I will get it wrong. Amen. Chances are you and I will get it wrong. Why? Because we all have our prejudices. We all have our little bit thinking here and there. Lord, I love everybody but not these. It is. The way the Jews treated the Gentiles then is like many of the Indians have treated the untouchables in India. Or even the leprosy affected in India. They are like the outcasts. Even the Jews are like the outcasts. And Jesus goes and hugs them. Everyone thinks, what is wrong with Jesus? How, how can you do that? He says, he looks at the new family. This is completely different. There's a sense of this one new man in Christ. It's such a huge thing for us to get hold of. 
God will bring to your church people who are not like you. Praise God when you said that. Not like you. Sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't. But you will only accept them if your foundation is correct. And our natural tendency is we gravitate to our homogeneous groups. And you meet someone, I have a, you know, you know, you talk to them, I don't know how you introduce yourself to people. And what people get to know about you in the first 15 minutes. What do you say? Liverpool fans, come on man, let's watch the match together. Those by the way, Liverpool get around those people. Because of some football team, they became friends. And then in the church, they are the closest of friends. You see, why? You're not going there. No, yeah, I don't enjoy that. You're watching a Liverpool match today. Please enjoy your Liverpool match. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying there's something about we get to gravitate towards our homogeneous groups in such a way that sometimes we can fundamentally miss the very understanding that we are all the family of God. Amen. And so sometimes it might just look a little, may need a little bit more effort to engage with someone who is not like you. Amen. And you may say, why should I do that? I don't have fun with him. No, no, the gospel is not only about fun. You're building the church of Jesus Christ. The way saying we are all one body. We all belong to one another. You know, years ago, before we actually launched Messiah Church, God had given me a dream like a vision. This is what I saw in the vision. I saw one rich man, like a king. And he was worshipping. He's got all these ornaments and he's worshipping. And, and, and in one hand, he's holding a very frail, weak, poor man. And the poor man kind of worshipping the Lord. I saw this thing and I'm in my, in my dream saying, Lord, what a beautiful picture heaven will be. It will be so glorious to see this in heaven. And in that dream, God spoke to me. This is not a picture of heaven. This is the kind of church I want you to build. I was in tears. Flesh that is one of the part of the journey of when we were saying, let's start this vision. We will see a church. I still remember. We said, building a large, multicultural, multicolored resource church with a heart for the needy. That became the Messiah Church, a thing which we actually put together. This was something that birthed in me. I said, Lord, I was in tears. I thought it's a picture of him. He said, no, this is the picture of the new family of God that I want to build. Everyone can belong to me. And the key verse for me that became, accept one another. As Christ has accepted you. Hallelujah. You may not become best friends of one another. That's being super challenging. To become best friends of everybody. But the bare minimum can be, because we're all family of God, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. It's a fundamental foundation of building God's church. Because if we don't build on that, you will, without you realizing, after a few years, things will go like this and you will have a football club church. And you'll have a this ministry church, and you'll have that ministry church, and you miss out on the totality of what the church of Jesus Christ is. Built on the I'll need to end now, isn't it? Yeah. I'll just pray. Father, we thank you that you've given the community of grace of vision. And as they've been building and as they're going to build in days and Weeks ahead, Lord, I just ask you that you would give them revelation of the foundation to you. The apostolic foundation that you want this new community that you are building to, to flourish. So I pray, Lord, for each one here, let the word of God dwell in them richly. Give revelation. I just pray, Lord, supernatural revelation of how you want us to honor you through your church. Bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.